All right, we're going to do a quick review. We've been talking about the importance of, uh, this is what I'm talking about, the, come on, you can do it. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah, that might help. Maybe not. There we go. The 20th try works. Okay. So knowing the Christ of Christianity, what I'd like to do tonight is do a quick review before we get into our text of Scripture, which is basically most of 1 John chapter 3. We've been talking about fellowship. Fellowship comes from the Greek word koinonia. It means to have something in common. That word is also translated concord or agreement. The Bible talks about what fellowship hath light with darkness. Fellowship means agreement, covenant. That, that relationship. And so when we think about the relationship that we have with one another, it's because of the fellowship that we have with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the theme of First John. So real quickly, we're going to do a review. Remember, we talked about the foundation of Christian fellowship. And what is the foundation of Christian fellowship? It is certainly the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that we have in him. And we talked about the, um, the purity of Christian fellowship. Remember, John writes that that we should walk as Jesus walked. We'll even talk about that tonight. So there's this call to holiness and purity, and the Christian fellowship is a holy calling. Then we said that there's the assurance of Christian fellowship, that we know that we are in Christ, and Christ is in the Father. And so our relationship is not based upon our righteousness, our good works, anything that we do to keep it. It's based upon the promises of God. Then we talked a little bit about the maturity of Christian fellowship, we took, looked at the three stages of Christian maturity. We said little children, young men, and fathers. And then, of course, we talked about last week the authenticity, or a couple weeks ago, actually, the authenticity of Christian fellowship. <clears throat> As we looked at what it says here concerning those who would preach or teach something concerning Christ that was not true. For instance, that he wasn't the Messiah or that he did not bodily uh, come to earth. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the, um, the evidence of Christian fellowship. That's tonight's lesson uh, heading, the, the evidence of Christian fellowship. All right, so I want to talk about that tonight concerning that importance, okay? So the first thing I want us to notice is this. The Apostle John tells us that true fellowship with God is marked by the reception of divine love that transforms the heart and life of every believer. All right, let's begin in verse 1. The Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. It's an interesting word that's being used here, and that's the word knoweth or know. And that word, of course, carries with it something in common. There is no fellowship that we have with the world anymore now that we're part of Christ's kingdom. Now, we might have relationships, certainly with our family, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, and that doesn't disappear. But the Bible says that the world knoweth us not. When we say the world, sometimes we need to understand what that means, because in context, it means different things. It's the Greek word cosmos, and sometimes it literally means the earth, the planet, the terra firma. Sometimes it means the people of the earth, for God so loved the world. But then sometimes it means the world system, like when Satan is described as being the God of this world. So here it's saying the world, the world system doesn't know who we are. You know what, we should be foreign to the ways of the world, amen? We should be. Now, you might have had a past that was very much involved in the world, but it doesn't mean that we isolate ourselves from the world, but we're not in the world. We, we, we understand that distinction. And sometimes that's hard to describe because every different groups of, of you know, even today, groups of Christians define worldliness in different ways. Some do it by the outer cloak and, and the adorning, and, and other people do it by, you know, what, your view of the government, and other people do it by complete isolation, and, and, you know, there's all different levels. But when the Bible warns us about not loving the world, nor the things that are in the world, what does that mean? What does that mean? And so he's saying here, John is saying, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Never get over the fact that we are indeed the children of God, and that will never change. Isn't that awesome to think about? And so what I'd like to do tonight is to, to, is to notice a couple of things. What I'd like to see, if I can get this to work, is three aspects tonight. The spiritual connection, sanctified conduct, 
and sacrificial care. These are all evidences that I believe John is teaching us from this passage of Scripture concerning what it means to be a true believer. Evidences of a true believer. All right? So let's notice the first one is a, the spiritual connection. Okay? What does that mean, the spiritual connection? A true believer should never tire of the eternal blessing that God is his heavenly Father. And so when we think about it, the Apostle John reminds the believer that his heavenly Father is not, that, that his heavenly family is not accepted by the world, but this life is not what it's all about anyway. So the rejection of the world shouldn't devastate us, should it? The Bible says we're just pilgrims passing through. So we're not worried about pleasing man. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I'm not preaching to please man, I'm preaching to please God. I'm honoring God. My life is distinctively different because I am a child of God. I found this interesting, this one thought here. Um, just, as a, okay. just as a child bears resemblance to the parents who bore him, so too does a child of God bear the image of his heavenly Father. In what ways? In what ways? How do we bear the image of our heavenly Father as children? What ways? Sue, what do you think? Okay. So in our, our conduct, sure. Somebody else? Gordon, what do you think? Sure. Don? Okay. With our, with our spirit, is that what you said? Fruit of the spirit, absolutely. Somebody else? Gordon? How we love the sun, Sure. And so, okay, mom, go ahead. Yeah, our obedience. So when we bear the image of God, we can see that, that we're uniquely created by God and that we have a body, soul, spirit. But there's something that we're representing, there's someone that we're representing. And so we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God not only owns us, but he's created us with that distinctive mark. And so John is saying, behold what manner of love the Father hath hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, as a result of that truth, that you are a child of God, the Bible says, therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Knew who not? Even when the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth, many did not receive him. Even the people who should have. I mean, think about the people that accused Jesus of having a demon were actually saying to God in the flesh that he had a demon inside of him. Think about that. And that's why Jesus rebuked the Pharisees so intensely. You know, so we think about this statement. Um, J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, said, if you want to judge how well someone understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of having God as his heavenly father. Now, I think for all of us in this room, that is encouraging to know. And I think we're constantly reminded of that. But some people... Maybe their view of God being Heavenly Father is negative, is not right. And so when we read this, we are truly the children of God. And so if we're truly born again, we embrace this truth, and we love this truth, and we say this is absolutely true. Let's keep reading. Then in verse 2, John uses a word that means one who is loved. And it doesn't necessarily mean that John alone loves them. He loves them because he knows that God loves them as well. So he calls them beloved. It's a term of endearment, but it's not unique to John in that he's not writing this as if he is just the only one who loves them. It's interesting to know that God loves us through people. And so he says, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. All right, a lot of pronouns going on there. But let's think about this. This verse right here is telling us something about the fact that our connection or our relationship with God is revealed in the fact that we are not yet who exactly we're, who we're going to be for eternity. And so here's a promise, a wonderful promise. It says, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. What does that mean? It means that though we have been saved and though we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and though God can do great and mighty things in and through us, we're not yet completely who
who we will be. And so he's explaining that. He says, but we know that when he shall appear. Who's the he? Who shall appear? Jesus Christ. So here's the promise of his coming. We shall be like him. Who's the we? True believers. God's people. Distinctive from those who may just talk a good game but don't have a real relationship. Those who are truly the sons and daughters of God. The children of God will know that when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's talking about the glorified state of the believer in Christ. And that is not what we are yet, but we will be. So there's a promise of that glorified state, the promise of that transformation. The verse that I have up on the screen is Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, in which the Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Philippi explaining the word, uh, or the, explaining salvation. He says, for our conversation is in heaven. Now, the word conversation sometimes means our citizenship or our uh, manner of living or our, our who we are. So it says, our conversation is in heaven. And so that goes right along with what John is saying here. It says, the world doesn't accept us. The world doesn't know who we are because this is not our home. We shouldn't get too rooted in this place because this is our eternal home. It says, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if heaven is our home, we're looking forward to that day when we will be united with our Savior and with our God, eternally worshiping him. That's where our heart, there should be great anticipation for that. So then look what it says. Who shall change our vile body? Now, we, we, we see that from the perspective of regardless of how well in shape you are or how healthy you are or whatever it may be, regardless of the healthiest person all the way to the sickliest person, the point is the vile is talking about our sinful condition. Remember, we talked about this on Wednesday night. The law of entropy entered into the universe with God's condemnation of his own creation because of Adam and Eve's sin. So the fittest person, the person who thinks that they are, you know, have it all together, has a vile body because they are carnal. They are under the curse. But the promise that Paul is reminding everybody is that God will change our vile body. God will change that. When is that going to take place? When we see Christ. So it says that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So Jesus Christ has a glorified body. And we will be like him. It says, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So look what it says now in verse 3. There's a transition here. So not only do we see that God has called us to recognize our, our sonship, so to speak, our family relationship, and now the sanctified conduct flows from that. Because we are a child of the king, there are expectations that come along with certainly our relationship to God. I want to point out a couple of those, all right? Being part of the family of God transforms every perspective of life, including one's understanding of the wickedness of sin and the beauty of holiness. In a moment, we're going to compare this passage to 1 Peter chapter 1, but the standard of holiness is the one true God, not ourselves. It's not how good we think we're doing. It's always to God. Now, where do we see this, this call to sanctified conduct? Verse 3, he says, every man that hath this hope, what hope? The hope of eternal life, the hope of a glorified body, the hope of God changing you, the hope of the resurrection, the hope that we have. Remember, hope is not wishful thinking, but rather a confident expectation of the promises of God. That's what the word hope means. So here he's saying, every man that hath this confident expectation in the promises of God, in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. What does it mean to purify? What does that mean? Well, probably one of the best ways to explain that is really what goes on when a surgeon is getting ready to go on and, and operate. And there are procedures that are involved in that that are, that are very important. Because when you are opened up, and <laughs> no matter the severity of the, 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 or the seriousness of the surgery, you want to make sure there's no contamination when that takes place. And we're thankful for that. We've come a long ways in our history of surgeries uh, from when a lot of people, when you had surgery, you were nervous that you wouldn't make it out because, or that you'd get some other disease as a result of the surgery. Today, having surgery is just a commonplace thing. But that's what that word means. How do we purify ourselves? If we have our sins forgiven, 
and we're washed in the blood. What purifying does this mean? Is this this constant asking God to forgive us of all of our sins and getting saved again? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a mindset, like we talked about this morning, that is in step with what God desires for us. It is, a, the, it is the pursuit of holy living. And, and this is so important because he said, if we have this hope, we're going to choose to live the purified life. So we purify ourselves even as he is pure. Who's the he? Christ. Look again in verse 3. Who is the he? Even as he is pure. So we compare that to 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's hold our spots here in 1 John 3 and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. I keep saying 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 15. All right? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Sanctified conduct. All right? Look what it says in verse 13. This is the Apostle Peter writing. He says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Isn't it interesting that when you're challenged through, like a, like a sermon this morning, we talked about the word mind, that sometimes that word pops up in different places. It appears tons of places in the New Testament. So when we think about our heart or our mind, it says, gird up the loins of your mind. That's kind of a, a weird statement, the loins of your mind. The loins are kind of like the midsection, like a soldier would actually take part of his garment, and he would kind of wrap it up in a position that enabled him to run. So he's doing that to kind of get serious about what he's doing. He's getting focused. And so this is what Peter is saying. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. Get ready to run a race that matters for eternity's sake. Then he says, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I think it's fair to compare this hope with John's hope. They're the same. So this hope is the resurrection. This hope is eternal life. This hope is the changed, uh, the, the glorified body. So in verse 4, he says, as obedient children. Uh, we, we know what they, they look like, right? Obedient children. They're, 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 they do exist. Right, parents? Amen? Is it oh, me or amen? Yeah, I'm getting some looks. Okay. But it says, as obedient children, right, children that are in this room? Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Now, it's interesting. You can compare this this word ignorance with other verses that actually, like in Ephesians, it talks about how we did things in the ignorance of your flesh or the ignorance of your, of your sin nature, your old man. So he's saying, don't conduct yourselves, don't fashion yourselves, don't, don't live your life according to who you were before you got saved. Now, we know what verse 15 says because it's, it's a, a, a verse that's often quoted, but he says in verse 15, but as he which hath called you is holy... God is the he, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So the standard of holiness, as we go back to 1 John chapter 3, is God. You might say, well, Pastor Small, that's perfection. That's complete holiness. How could we ever be like that? It's not that we're trying to attain unto perfectness, because we know that we'll not be that way. But the purifying state of mind is truly that our actions flow from the regenerated heart. That we know that we can do what God wants us to do when we ask him uh, for his help and his guidance. So it's not something that we just resign ourselves to say, well, you know what, nobody's going to live perfectly. We can be like Christ. And oftentimes people make provisions for the flesh because they kind of act as though living holy is impossible. You know, the Bible tells us in many different places that we're supposed to walk blamelessly. That doesn't mean perfect. No one's going to do that. But we should strive to be like Christ. Amen? That should be our heart's desire. So we're not, we're not just kind of giving up and saying, well, you know, everybody sins, so it's just a matter of when you do it. The pursuit is God. The love is God. The desire is to please and honor God. And so God doesn't command us and instruct us to do things that, that can't be done. It's through God's strength and power. And this is really what he's saying here. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. I want you to think about this. What is the purity of holiness? What is that? A couple thoughts. Purifying our hearts spiritually can be understood in a similar way to that of a surgeon preparing himself for surgery. And I already mentioned that, right? But if you look back to... And I know I just told you to go back to 1 John. I'll read this verse. But if you read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, it's interesting. 
what he says here. And I just want to share this verse with you because it's worth reading. It says this, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So here's the point that I'm trying to make, and really it's what John is trying to make here, is that the purification of our heart is not just trying to fix the outside. It's, it's asking God to help us with our hearts and our minds first. And then everything else follows suit. Does that make sense? I think we understand that. Sometimes we can play the part. Sometimes we can emphasize that even with our young people. Act a certain way. Do this. Do that. That's what holiness is. Holiness is about the heart. Man looks on the outside. Where does God look? He looks on the heart. So the purification is, that. this is what Peter was saying. He said, seeing that you have purified yourselves in obeying the truth and, love, and you love the brethren, do these things. It's assumed that you understand what that means. And what that means is that we're committed to honoring God with our lives and obeying him in our actions. Let's keep reading. Look what it says in verse 4. Now I want you to notice this. Believers must understand our high calling and, and by God's strength and for his glory seek to live godly lives. So now, notice now he's going to compare what really proves whether or not you're a true believer or not. And so that's why a lot of people go to 1 John when they're trying to help a Christian who might be struggling with their salvation. There might be people who are legitimately having concerns about their salvation because they know that they've not been regenerated. They've played the part of a Christian, but they're not truly Christians. So John is writing to explain a couple of things. Look, notice what he says. Whosoever committeth sin. And sometimes when we see words that end in E-T-H, it's the equivalent of how we would talk today is the word S. Whoever commits sin. This is a continual, habitual lifestyle. This is the result of someone who has not been saved, not been regenerate. So whosoever committeth sin continually transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Verse 5 says, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Who again is John talking about? Christ. So he's not comparing us to other Christians. He's not saying be like me or be like the apostles or be like, you know, whoever. He's saying our standard of holiness is the Lord Jesus Christ. So then he says in verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him, abideth in who? Abideth in Christ, lives, just like John 15 tells us, that we abide in him and his word abides in us and we will bear fruit. It says, this person does not sin. Now this passage of scripture is of great controversy. Because over the years there have been people through what's called a, quote, holiness movement, taught that a Christian could somehow attain perfect sanctification. That is not what it's teaching here at all. But here's what it does teach. John is saying when we're walking in the Spirit, and when we're, it, when we're being connected to God in a very real way, when we're abiding in Him, we're not going to sin like we did before we came to know Christ as our Savior. This is an identifying mark of a believer. So when I hear about people who said they got saved when they were three, but live sinful lives, what fruit do they have? Some prayer that they prayed? It's saying, whosoever abideth in him does not continually sin. It doesn't mean that people don't fall into sin. It doesn't mean that even a pastor or a missionary or an evangelist or people that we kind of hold in great high esteem as, as being more spiritual than other people, when they fall into sin, it doesn't mean, oh, they probably weren't saved. Maybe they weren't, but maybe they just fell into sin. It happens. But he's saying, when your lifestyle is governed by, a, by a, 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 the living that is contrary to the word of God, it is an evidence that maybe that, uh, truly that person is not saved. So look at verse 6. Look at the second part to it. Whosoever sinneth or sins hath not seen him, neither known him. What is John saying? He's saying this person doesn't truly know God. It is not our job to go around and be judgers of whether somebody is saved or not. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. But we can bring to the attention of people who might be struggling with that, which is, which is what we're going to do even th this upcoming week with some of our young people, is that we're not going to try to be the Holy Spirit. If you think that you're, you, you have a job to be the Holy Spirit convicting, you don't understand God. 
Because God will work through his word in amazing ways. But when I preach, I'm not trying to coerce anybody. I'm not trying to deceive anybody. I'm not trying to manipulate anybody. I'm just going to preach the truth and let God convict. But there's some young people that I'm really concerned about. I'm not sure if they're saved. It would be wrong of me to go up to them and say, I don't think you're a Christian. Maybe they aren't. Maybe they are. I don't know. But here he's trying to say, what is the evidence? It's revealed in sanctified living, sanctified conduct. In fact, I think there's another slide that I have here. I can get this to work. Okay, no, nope, I'm not there yet. But l- let's keep reading. Verse 7. Then he says this. So now, remember we said who the little children are? The little children aren't the fathers. The little children aren't the young men. The little children are the new believers. So John specifically writes to them. He says, little children, let no one deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Now, what verse would you compare that to? I would take someone to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says, and he, who is Christ, who knew no sin, became what for us? Became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he's saying right here, whoever does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Now, some would argue, well, John... What if somebody only appears to be doing righteous activities, but their heart isn't really right? That's not what John is saying. He's not talking about false teachers or false professors. He's not talking about fake righteousness. He's talking about real righteousness. He's not putting the word righteous in quotes. He's saying someone who lives righteously is proving that they're righteous. That's all he's saying. So we look at verse 8, and it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. He is still part of the God of this world. He's still part of Satan's kingdom. So the transformation changes our behavior, absolutely. Sanctified conduct flows from a right relationship with God. And so if there's no change, there's no evidence of the new life, we don't give people false hope based upon a a profession of faith that may or may not have truly occurred. He's saying, therefore, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Satan is the original deceiver because he committed sin, and of course he was banished, and then he, of course, was the one who... Uh, deceived Adam and Eve, and, and so he says he's the one who sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Because ultimately, it was him. And so we see that. And so John is reminding the origin of sin, not saying that this is some made-up story. It's true. Adam and Eve were real people. Satan is a real being, and he came in, and that is why Christ came, to destroy the works of the devil. Now, verse 9 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. That's the, that's the Holy Spirit that, that began to work in convicting and drawing and saving and regenerating and, and making you a new person, making you that child. He cannot sin because he is born of God. And that is your position in Christ. So you're going to hear me say this a lot. Live in the reality of your identity. Live according to who you are in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You are a new creature or creation in Christ. That's what John is saying. So if you know God, you're going to hate evil and not going to continue in sin. So look what it says in verse 10. And this kind of wraps up the second point. Sanctified conduct. In this, the children of God are manifest or revealed. Here's the proof. Here's the convincing proof evidence. And this is what John was saying. Here's how we know. How do we know who really are the children of God and the children of the devil? Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So when I asked you a little bit ago, what, is, what are the evidences of our salvation? Some of you correctly stated that loving God, loving each other. So that kind of leads us to our, our third and final point, And it is sacrificial care. One of the most distinguishing evidences of a true believer in Christ is a genuine love for his brothers and sisters. And this is way more than just saying that you love somebody. Love is action. Love is in the way in which we treat people. And so this is what John was saying. He was trying to show this. He's saying, if you're loving righteousness, you're not just talking a good game. You actually back it up through your lives. So I want you to think about this. Our actions towards those in real need of help reveal whether or not we are truly walking in the truth. 
And so it's important that we understand that. I know sometimes it can be difficult, and, and we ask, need to ask God for wisdom, but sometimes there are people who are in need, and we want to help them. We're not always sure exactly the best way to help them. There's a woman who's come by probably about four or five times, and she's asked for gas. I follow her car. I pump the gas for her. I, put in, um, I give her some, some gas. I've witnessed to her. I've talked to her. And I'm not sure what her background is. I'm not sure what her, her situation is. But I'm trying to love her the best way that I can. And I have peace about what I'm doing, even if it's my own money. And sometimes we're not sure because you know, I've even heard people, like we've, we've talked about doing some outreach to the poor, and, and there's been, I understand we have to have wisdom. Absolutely. But when, when John writes this, and we read this, and God convicts you about doing certain things, oftentimes I think we're not as mindful to the people who are in great need as we ought to be. So very easy to, to not even think about how much money we spend on, on lavish things that may not necessarily be lavish compared to the, the, the wealthy and the rich and famous, but just things that we spend money on when there's other people who have real needs. And, and then you might say, well, well, is giving somebody food, is that really a, a long-term way of helping somebody? Well, it may not be, but at the time, that's what they need. And John addresses that. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 11. He says, for this is the message that, we have, that ye have heard from the beginning that we should love one another, all right? So again, sacrificial care, what does that mean? Now he uses a negative to prove his point. He says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. So it's saying here that Cain was of Satan because his, his conduct revealed the fact that he did not love God. What did he do? We know that he killed his brother. Wherefore, slew he him? Because his own works were what? evil, and his brothers righteous. We get, just got done saying, what is the authenticating mark of a true believer? Righteous living. Righteous living because you've been transformed. Cain was of the devil. Abel, of course, was not. So then in verse 13, as John is writing this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's writing, this is what's called a general epistle. So this is to all believers. He says, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Now, where does that come from? It's almost like seems out of place that all of a sudden he just says, marvel not that the world hate you. Well, why would they hate you? Where is that from? Because the way in which we are to live our lives is counter to how the world system conducts itself. Many people, even, quote, charitable organizations, sometimes do things, and their heart really isn't to help the people. It's to kind of help themselves. I'm not saying all. Many Christian organizations are fine and good, and there's some that we give to on a personal basis. But what I'm saying is the world doesn't know us because they don't understand maybe our motive behind our love. There should be sincerity and purity in the way in which we help someone. I want you to think back to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was rebuking some people when he was teaching, was he not? Remember, think about when he talked about how we fast. Right? He says, don't be like the Pharisees, which kind of make themselves look like they, they're worse than they really are. And he says, when you pray, don't do it to be seen of men. But then what he said, when you give, don't do it to be seen of men either, right? So he's saying that they have their reward. How then should we give? Secretly, lovingly, meeting a real need? What is this proving? It's proving that we really love God. But John kind of explains a little bit as we keep going. The world doesn't know us. They hate they hate us because Satan isn't for that at all. So verse 14 says, we know that we have passed from death unto life. What does that mean? We know that we're no longer unsaved. We know that we've gone from unregenerate sinner to redeemed believer. That's what he means. He's saying we're no longer lost, but we're saved. Here's how we know that we're truly one of God's family. It says because we, what are the next three words, church? Love the brethren. Now again, you might say, well, that's easy to do. I, can, I have no problem with that. Until you really think about what that means. That's far, far more than loving the people who love you. We would have a lot less problems and drama in our Christian community if we really loved each other the way that God wants us to love each other. It's not loving with strings attached. It's not loving the people who are lovable. It's loving by not just saying, I love you. It's how we treat other people. So it goes beyond our community, our, we, I might even use this word, our clique, 
And it goes, it's to everybody that is in need. That's why I put up on the screen. Our actions towards those in real need of help reveal whether or not we are truly walking in the truth. And this is what John was saying. He goes, this is how you know you've truly gone from being an unsaved person to a saved person is that you'll love the brethren. It says, he that loveth not his brother abideth or lives in death. So this is a genuine mark of, of or evidence of Christian fellowship, sacrificial care. Now, verse 15 says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Wow. Well, how, how are they killing someone with their actions? They're rejecting someone in need. Hating carries with it the idea of rejecting someone or not helping them. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So it doesn't matter what somebody says. It doesn't matter what they profess. It is revealed in their actions. That's why in verse 16 says, hereby perceive. Or this is how we truly know. This is how we can really see whether or not this is true. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Remember, sacrificial care. God loved us sacrificially, right? He loved us with the cross, Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So John says, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, I want to be honest with you right now. Sometimes this, we scratch our heads and say, what does that mean? How do we lay down our lives for other people? Is this only talking about a soldier who's helping another soldier? Is this literally talking about my life being given up uh, for someone else? I think there's a lot more to this. I think what this is talking about is the way in which we are not becoming so selfish with the things that we have, that we're unwilling to help those who are in real need. We have so much. We have been so blessed, have we not? Even those of you that may not think that, you really have. Just take a missions trip to a, a place like Haiti or Jamaica, and you'll come back thanking the Lord for every little thing that you have. Running water, things like that we just take for granted. But you know, we look at this and say, how can I help those who are in need? How am I willing to, quote, lay down my life for the brethren? I'm willing to see a way in which I can help them. Now, verse 17 gives an example. Whoso hath this world's good, meaning you have plenty, I mean, you have, you're not, there's nothing that you really need. You have everything that you want. And seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion. It's interesting, the word bowels is translated there. We might understand it to mean heart. You become cold-hearted. You become like Ebenezer Scrooge, and you, you have no desire to help. That's what, he's, that's what John is saying. You see the need, but you have no desire to help. You can certainly help the problem, but it doesn't, it, it, there's no compassion flowing from you. This is what John says. How dwelleth the love of God in him? How do you, how can you say that you love God and you have no desire to help those who are in real need? And this is the acid test, or this is the evidence of Christian fellowship. And I want us to note this. Our love for others reveals three things, and I want to share those with you quickly tonight. Our love for others reveals our salvation in Christ. It displays our obedience to our Heavenly Father and shines our light as a testimony of God's grace to others. Is it interesting that the fruit of the Spirit begins with love? 1 Corinthians 13 talks about, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity, which is agapao, which is just another word for love. I am of sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. Though, though I give my body to be burned and give all my money to the poor and do all these amazing things, if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. Do you see that? And so this is what I want you to notice real quick. I want to give you a couple thoughts on this. <clears throat> Number one, how does it reveal our salvation? We'll eventually get this, uh, get here in our study. But verse 7 of chapter 4 says, Beloved, let us love one another. Again, not just in word, but in deed and in truth. For love is of God. It's, it's a, a, an evidence of our salvation. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Could John be any more clear about how important it is that we do this? Okay? So he's saying genuine faith reveals itself in our love. So we go back to verse 17, and then he says in verse 18, or verse 17 says, How dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. I'm afraid that many of us, 
and I'm guilty as charged in this, can say one thing, but yet our actions sometimes don't always follow through with our, quote, love for others. Now, I praise the Lord that there's many, if not all in this room, who have demonstrated that love. And hopefully you see people, and it's not just people who are, who are poor or needy, but sometimes it's coming, along somebody who's dis, coming alongside someone who's discouraged or needs a word of, uh, of, of encouragement, edification, prayer. There's a number of different ways in which we can meet people's needs. But he's saying if you have the opportunity to help and you decide not to help, you're revealing whether or not you truly know what it means to be born again. Do you agree with me on what that's saying? Is that very clear? I think it's important that we understand that. Not only does it reveal our salvation, but I believe it also shows our obedience. This is Jesus who's speaking here in John 13, 34. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. It involves sacrifice. It involves giving of our time, talent, and treasures. There's no way of getting around it. We can't just give scraps to those who are in real need. We have to help, and sometimes it may quote, hurt a little bit. Let's keep reading in verse 19. Notice, church, it says this. Hereby we know that we are of the truth. John is saying, here's what assures our hearts of a real, genuine relationship with God. If you're concerned about whether you're truly born again or not, here's what can assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. What assures our hearts? If we're obedient to God, if we're obedient to God. And so the third point I want you to see is, is found in, um, in verse 35. Jesus goes on to say, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have what? One to another. Love. Just like faith is not some mystical, magical force, love is not just a concept or an idea. Love is the way in which we treat people. Love is the way that we speak to people. Love is revealed in the way that we drive and the way that we treat people who are in front of us in line. It's the way that we talk to one another in the hallways of our school or at our job or our neighbors. It's the way that we live our life. It's not, it's not limited to the times that we choose to be loving. It's, it's the conduct of our everyday living, not just our spiritual segment of life. And that's what Jesus was saying. This is the new commandment that I give you. This is what it means to truly love God. If you love God, you will love your neighbor. What story did Jesus give to explain that? What parable? The Good Samaritan. He said the priest and the Levite had every resource to help the person, but their religiousness, so to speak, forbade them from touching someone or helping someone. And Jesus said, see, you're saying you love God, and there's a person that's in need. It's the Samaritan who came over, and he loved that person, and he sacrificed his time. He put himself in danger. He brought him to the hotel. He said, whatever this guy owes, just, just put it on my tab. I'll come and take care of him. That's love. That's love. So you might say, well, what, what can we do about that? What, what is the challenge that I'm giving you as a church? Lift up your eyes and look to see who's truly in need and say, Lord, give me the wisdom to help the way that you'd want me to help. And not just a, a couple of times or not just an occasion. Let that be the, the way in which I live my life. Because, and I know this sounds kind of like a Christian bumper sticker, but you cannot outgive God. We shouldn't do it because of the reward, but I promise you this. You do something that honors God and loves God, God, God will make sure that that is taken care of. That, that's rewarded in, in this life or perhaps when you stand before him one day at the judgment seat of Christ. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Tonight, that's really all I wanted to challenge you with tonight as we continue our series, Knowing the Christ of Christianity. Do you really know Christ? Is your faith genuine? What are the evidences? We know that we are of the Father. Because of sanctified living, we reject sinful ways and sinful living. We embrace holiness, and certainly we're looking for those who are in need and loving people a biblical way. Maybe you're here tonight, you're struggling with that a little bit. Maybe it's this you know, habitual sin that God wants you to get out of your life. Maybe it's just your view of, of others. Maybe people just seem to be in your way rather than the people that God divinely appoints to be in your way so that you can minister to them. Ministry is messy. Sometimes when we love others, 
That means that we might be rejected. That's why a lot of people don't like to, to step out and do something because we think it's always going to go the way that we want it to. And it doesn't always work out that way, does it? We know we might be rejected. We, we know the help might be thrown right back in our face. But that doesn't mean we should stop doing it. God wants us to love. So let's let our testimony match up, our actions ma match up with our testimony. If we are truly followers of Christ, let's live a life pleasing to him. Let's love one another in a way that is far more than just what we say. It's with our actions and with our truth.